In the providence of God, this is where we are as we're working our way through Matthew. And uh, so these are thoughts that I've been meditating on for a couple of weeks. And this is not a, a message that has been put together specifically because of the context of life that we are going through right now as a church. Um, but it is what God has ordained for today. And I find that interesting and hopefully it will be beneficial for us as a, as a church at this time. Let's let's read verses 23 through 33. The same day, the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were with us seven brothers. The first died after he had married and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. Likewise, the second also and the third, even to the seventh. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken, you err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitudes heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. And then verse 34 tells us that when the Pharisees heard that, he had silenced the Sadducees. So that's the result of this interaction. Jesus silenced the Sadducees. Then they gathered together and came at him with another, another issue, which we'll deal with, Lord willing, next week. The same day, Matthew writes, the same day, the Sadducees came. And so you're aware that Jesus is being confronted by religious leaders. He's just days away from the purpose for which he came into the world. The ultimate purpose, of course, there are multiple purposes. And, and uh, one of the expressions of that purpose is the cross as a culminating purpose and all that's surrounded in that all the revelation that we are not going to go into that surrounds that event that's happening in this week just days away the religious leaders don't know this they're not aware of this they that's not on their radar they're wanting to shut Jesus down they don't accept him as the messiah and so they're trying to turn the crowds against Jesus and so having answered the Pharisees, disciples, and the Herodians, which we saw the last time that we were together, the Sadducees now take up the challenge to trip Jesus up with a theological question. Now the Sadducees were part of the religious ruling class among the Jews. They were less popular than the Pharisees. They didn't mingle among the regular folks like the Pharisees did, so they didn't have as much of an impact. But they were a powerful part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling, what would be considered the Supreme Court of the Jews. And just a, a couple of things about the Sadducees that plays into this interaction that Jesus has with them. They rejected oral tradition. The Pharisees didn't. The Pharisees believed they, they passed down the oral tradition of the father so they believed you know they had laws in addition to that which was written for example the, Saris, the Sa Sadducees weren't like that they accepted only the scriptures favoring the writings of Moses above other writings though they didn't totally reject the prophets they favored the writings of Moses interesting because that's where they go and that's where Jesus will go 
And they also deny the resurrection. Jesus, or excuse me, Matthew says so in verse 23, he's, verse 23, who say there is no resurrection. They, they denied the bodily resurrection, but they also denied any immortality of the soul. In other words, when it's over, it's over. And they also denied the existence of angels. Interesting because Jesus refers to angels and the answer that he gives uh, to them. I was thinking about who the Sadducees might compare to today because we don't, you know, we don't function in those categories as Jesus did when he walked upon the earth. And it seems to me that the Sadducees might compare to modern day moralists because they were moral individuals. And so I, I, I thought of them as modern day moralists, whether secular or religious, whose priority is this life. The Sadducees lived for this life. In other words, to them, the good life or the bad life was in this life. And so what you made of life, you made of it here. And that wasn't to the exclusion of the Mosaic law. In fact, they would say to have the best life, live according to the law of Moses. But it was only, it only pertained to this life. In other words, there is no future judgment to be concerned about. There's no life after this. So the motive in the Sadducees mind for living in this age, in this world, is found right now. And so you might say, dead is dead. And that's a common thinking in our day. And it can even impact us if we're not careful. Though we might not say that, it's possible that we can live that way. Dead is dead. And so Jesus challenges this specific thinking in this encounter. His emphasis in the answer that he gives is really upon resurrection life as it pertains to believers. And really Luke's account makes this more clear. Let me read a few verses from Luke's rendering of this same event in Luke chapter 20. Jesus answers the Sadducees, verse 34, the sons of this age, this world, it might be translated in your translation, but the sons of this age, he's talking about that's the word for the age in which we presently live. The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age. So in Jesus' mind, the parameters of life in his mind are this age and an age to come. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. So you can hear in what Luke gives us that it's quite clear that Jesus is thinking in the category of those who will participate as sons of God, as children of God in the resurrection. Of course, we know from Scripture he doesn't exclude others, but that seems to be the focus in the response that he, that he gives. And of course, skeptics and unbelievers, like the Sadducees, ask speculative questions, don't they? They love to do that. They love to do that generally. They love to do that in relationship to Christians speculative questions. And they do so in order to stump the believer, just like they're doing with our Lord here, or to make a mockery of what we believe to be true. You do know that we believe to be true things that we've never seen, right? And the world likes to capitalize on that. Even the religious world likes to capitalize on that. Unbelievers like to capitalize on that. Can you prove that there's life after death? Can you prove there is a heaven and a hell? Can, can you prove that? Sadduc Sadducees say no. Skeptics say no. In fact, Sadducee, Sadducees say that's foolish thinking. 
And so they, like similar skeptics of our own day, ask a question that they believe will demonstrate the absurdity of resurrection life. And they appeal to the scriptures. They appeal to the law of Moses to set up their question. In verse 24, teacher, Moses said that if a man dies having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for his, his brother. And this is a law that you'll find in Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 and 6 specifically, but it goes all the way down to verse 10, and it's called the Leveret Law. Not because it had to do anything with the, the Levitical law, Levitical priesthood. Leveret is an idea of a man, a man who uh, dies, leaves a wife, but he leaves no children, no offspring. And so his, his name will go extinct or there will be no inheritance left in his name. And so the law was given to perpetuate family name, family inheritance. And so they pick up on this law and they give their example in verses 25 through 27. And I'm not going to read those verses again, but you know, guy, a woman marries and her first husband dies. There's no children. And so according to the Leverett law, he, uh, her, his brother is given to her. And the same thing happens over and over again until the seventh one also marries and dies. There's no offspring. And then she dies as, as well. And you can almost imagine the Sadducees wryly smiling as they give their example. In verse 28, they come to their conclusion, their punchline. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. Now, there's a lot of things that we could say, and we can actually create some humor here because, you know, this example that's being given is kind of a ridiculous example, but Jesus doesn't go there. If the question was from honest, sincere hearts, it really isn't so strange, is it? I mean, you think about it. Haven't you wondered about your relationship with someone with whom you've been married, either even if it's a single marriage or maybe there have been multiple marriages and if they all end up in heaven, have you ever wondered what the relationship is going to be like? I had somebody just this last week who didn't know I was going to preaching, preach on this actually ask me that. Interesting. And my response to him was, well, Jesus gives us the answer, tune in and you'll hear it. It wasn't somebody from here. And I find Jesus' response interesting. He says, you are mistaken. In verse 29, you, you are in error or you are deceived. Deceived about what? In error about what? Mistaken about what? While he answers their question, he really is answering something far more significant, and that's their errant theology. And what was their errant theology? There is no resurrection. Their denial of the resurrection and their supposing that such a scenario that they present creates a problem for the resurrection state. And that's what is being considered here, not just resurrection, but the state or the condition or the age of the resurrection. It really reveals, as Jesus says, their ignorance of two things, the scriptures and the power of God. The scriptures and the power of God. By the way, many errors can be traced to that problem right there. An ignorance of the scriptures and the power of God. But brethren, it's possible to know a lot of scripture the Sadducees were not biblically ignorant. They knew a lot of scripture. They, they were able to draw from this leveret law. I mean, did you know that law existed? They knew 
the first five books of, Mo, uh, uh, of the Scriptures especially very well. But as surely as the Sadducees were wrong because they didn't really know the truth of Scriptures, they didn't really have an understanding of the meaning of Scriptures, so it can be for those of our day. And so they can, as I've heard people do, draw from Scriptures and from those very Scriptures, mock the God and mock the intentions and mock the plan, mock the purpose of God from the Scriptures. And the other issue is not knowing God, the power of God. If God is not almighty, then only what seems doable is believable. True? If God is not almighty, only what seems doable to our minds is believable. And so Jesus answers their conundrum in the first couple of verses before he then turns his attention to what really is the more significant matter, and that is the issue, the fact of the resurrection life. But we need to deal with both. And so first, notice in verses 29 and 30, the power of God will transform life for the children of the resurrection. The power of God will transform life for the children of the resurrection. And I think that's the the leading idea that Jesus is giving, you notice in verse 29 when he says, you're mistaken not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God for, there's that connecting word, it's because. In other words, there is not a limit because of the power of God. And if you really understood scriptures, you would know this, that because of the power of God in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels of God in heaven. And so their question did not take into consideration God's ability to resolve to our limited understanding, what seems an insurmountable problem. Think about that, because that's exactly where a lot of the questions of skeptics today comes from. And sometimes, sometimes they can come to our own minds. Questions that seem unresolvable about many things, including the state of the resurrection. Don't you have such questions about future things? But we must not discount the power of God to resolve the mysteries that are in our mind, that come to our mind. And if we don't have the answer to it, then search the scriptures to see if God has given an answer to it. But if he hasn't, resolve the answer in this, God is able, right? He who formed this world by the word of his power to fit his purpose for this present life is certainly able to resolve any and all conflicts that trip us up as we think about life in the age to come. But Jesus doesn't mock their example as an hypothetical absurdity. But he shows that it's not an issue. You have raised an objection. You've raised something that seems in your mind to be unanswerable. But Jesus says, no, it is answerable. And here I'll give you the answer. In the resurrection age, our relationships will be different from our relationships in this life. Verse 30. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are like the angels of God in heaven. No, that's not going to answer every question that you have. But Jesus is giving us a fundamental reality, a fundamental truth here, and that there is going to be a transformation. There's going to be a change. And in the resurrection, even if you had seven spouses. Can you imagine that? Even if you had seven spouses and they all go to heaven, there's no problem. Simply put, there will be no marriage relationship in the resurrection age. So now, now we need to kind of park it here for just a second. I'm not 
going deep into this, but because that kind of poses a problem for some of you, maybe some of you. It doesn't really in my mind, but for some of you, because some of you have some have really, really, really good marriages. Right? I mean, you love, you can't imagine life without, without the relationship that you have right now. And for some of you, it's just getting gooder and gooder. Right? And, and, and you're, you're moving toward the golden years and, and it's exciting because of how you anticipate living out life with this person that God gave to you and blessed you with in this life. And so you might not be so thrilled with Jesus' answer. He says, he says, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Well, let me ask you this. Will the resurrection state in heaven without your spouse as your spouse, will that affect you in a negative way? And the answer has to be absolutely not. Because in that state, you as well as your spouse are going to be beholding the Lamb of glory. The Lamb is the glory of Emmanuel's land, right? And so our experience of union with Him, we heard this in the last hour, our experience, I was just relishing the thought as the list of these benefits of the union that we have with Christ. They were, you know, if you if you if you just marinate in that, it's overwhelming even in this life. But then when you think of the state of eternal existence in the resurrection from the dead, it will be a perfected and full enjoyment of everything that you have ebbed and flowed with enjoying in this life. Is that you get the point? But will you see your spouse? Yes. Sure about that? <laughs> see, some some of you, some of you think you, you're in concert with that. I had this happen at prison this last week. I'm 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 getting I mean, I'm I'm going along this guy. I, you know, I, I was I was saying things. He was finishing everything I said. And I just kind of stopped and I said, well, I guess I don't even need to preach. This guy's doing it for us, you know. And uh, but then but I didn't necessarily see that as a negative thing. Because it felt like there was agreement, right? And so there was we were in concert together. And I think that's a good thing. There are some. Man, I'm getting distracted here, aren't I? But there are some religious cultures where that's a common thing. Maybe not necessarily a bad thing. But yes, I believe you will see your spouse. And I think you will know that that spouse, was, that, that woman or that man was your spouse. Even if you had more than one and they both or whatever the number is are there. But you will what you will be doing is you will seeing him with whom you are united together with him. And I, if I can imagine it this way, and I did this several years ago, but when you get there and you, you see your spouse and you look at one another with, with incredible joy, this is going to uh, be hardly containable, I suppose. But then the joy really is not just that you to see one another as spouses, but you will be overwhelmed by the light of the glory of the Lamb because He is the reason that you're there and you will be overwhelmed by Him. And I would suggest to you that your relationship with your spouse will just simply be enhanced. I can't imagine that you won't know your spouse or spouses, but the relationship will be perfectly unique. Perfectly unique. You see, Jesus, Jesus doesn't say you won't love. He only says you won't marry. Your love will be so pure. 
And I know I'm pausing here for a moment because that hits me emotionally. And I, I want that in this life and I don't have it in this life. And I, and I desire it and I, I'm growing in it, but then there'll be no more growing in it. I don't think. Or maybe there will be. But it'll be, you know, even perfection can grow. <laughs> Try this one on for size. Was Jesus perfect? And yet He grew, the Scripture says. When He walked upon this, He grew. And so, just because there's perfection doesn't mean there can't be growth. And, and I know that... I, I'm sorry if I stumped your mind there on, on that one. Please, please come back and don't go too deeply there. But, but, but I, I am just saying that that this love will be so pure that it will exceed any bonds of earthly marriage. Your relationship will be exponentially superior. And you will have perfect capacity to relate not only to your spouse, but to all perfectly in that perfect expression of love. In those relationships, you will not be disappointed, but rather overjoyed with all the relationships that you will have in that day, in that resurrection age. Jesus says, he's, he says, there's a comparison here. You're going to be, he doesn't say you're going to be angels, so don't buy into that garbage. You're not going to be angelic in that sense. You're not going to have wings. You know, there, there's not going to be some transformation to angel beings. He says, but are like angels. There is a likeness. There, there's a certain similitude to angel to the angels of God in heaven. Luke describes it more carefully than Matthew does. But that, that likeness is really quite clear. There's going to be no marriage. There's going to be no reproduction. Just like the angels of God in heaven. And by the way, angels can't die. What is Jesus' point? We will have an immortal, unmarried, non-reproductive existence like angels. And our existence in the resurrection life will fit the eternal state. The Apostle Paul says it this way, and I'll be You'll be hearing from 1 Corinthians 15 um, again Tuesday, Lord willing, if you happen to go to the funeral service. But 1 Corinthians 15 and verses 42 through 44, the apostle writes, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in... This body remains corruptible and it goes into the grave corruptible, in corruption. But it is raised in incorruption. Why? Because it is raised to fit the eternal existence. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. That doesn't mean an invisible body. But it's a body that fits the spiritual state, that eternal state of glory. A body like Christ. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. I'm not going to go on and read the rest of the chapter, but you know when he talks about the resurrection, there's going to be a change. It's going to happen in a moment, a twinkling of an eye. It's going to, the trump will sound. There's going to be a change, a physical bodily change. While we don't have all the answers to our questions about the resurrection life, if you think them, or if somebody suggests some question to you that seems like you say, well, that is kind of bizarre. Yeah, I can't imagine what an answer to that question would be. Just remember, we're talking about God. We're talking about Almighty Father. Right? And we're talking about Him who is able to fit us for that which He's designed for us. And there will be no disappointment for those who are the children of the resurrection. The glory of His power will completely fit us for that glorious and eternal life existence. Enough said about that. Now Jesus shifts gears. 
You notice he does. Verse 31, but concerning the resurrection. So I've answered your question as much as I'm going to answer the question. But let's get to the real issue. But concerning the resurrection, not just the resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. In his defense of the resurrection of the dead, Jesus not only acknowledges the power of God, surely that's true, but he appeals to the very being of God from Scripture. He says, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And so Jesus quotes from their beloved Moses to answer the theological error that they carried. Now he could have turned to clearer passages in Scripture. In other words, he could have turned to what we might call a proof text. And, and there would have been nothing wrong with him doing that. Uh, for, for example, I mean, if someone were to say to me, well, can you find the resurrection uh, of the dead in the Old Testament Scriptures? I'd say, well, yeah, you know. I mean, there aren't abundant statements on it, but there are quite a few. I'll just read you a couple of them. Job 19, right? Job 19, 25 through 27, for I know, Job said, that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at, at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. But he doesn't go there. Jesus doesn't go there. He could have gone to Daniel 12 in verse 2. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Or what about Abraham? Do you remember Abraham and Isaac? He could have made reference to Genesis, one of their beloved books, book of Moses, and could have gone to the account of Abraham and Isaac. And then he could have said, God is able. Remember what Hebrews 11 verses 17 through 19 say by faith. Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative Sense as a figure, as a type. But he doesn't go there. He goes to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. A rather unique scripture, at least it seems to be on the surface, to go to to prove the point of the resurrection of the dead. But this is where Jesus goes. Exodus 3 verses 14 and 15. You know the burning bush incident. But here at this point where Jesus is, or excuse well, I think we could say Jesus, but where Yahweh, Jehovah, is telling Moses, I, I want you to go to my people. And I want you to, I want you to tell me, he's going to, I'm, I'm going to lead them out of Egypt. And Moses says, whom shall I say sent me? Verse 14, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. I love that. I, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, and this is where Jesus gets the, the quote. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, the Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial to all generations. I am. 
the God, the Lord God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I am the God. You're aware, aren't you, that that phrase, I am, is a phrase that you find repeatedly in the Gospel of John in particular. In which Jesus, He takes that expression to Himself for Himself. I am. I am. And those words were spoken to Moses. There in Exodus 3, these words, moreover, God said to Moses, He is saying to Moses, I am. And He's saying to Moses, I said this. I said this to Abraham. I said it to Isaac. I said it to Jacob. I'm saying it to you. He's saying this long after the death of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jehovah God entered into covenant personally with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what was meant by, I am the God of Abraham. I am the, not I was, not I will be, I am. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Death cannot end the covenant relationship that the living God committed Himself to. You see, He committed Himself to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And the conclusion that Jesus draws, we don't have to guess at it. He says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, there must be a resurrection. There must be. Because God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Resurrection of the dead then is grounded in the very essence of the life of the eternal God. Do you hear that? The resurrection of the dead is grounded in the very essence essence of the life of the eternal God. A life which you heard in the last hour precedes any other life. In fact, all life flows from that life, you see. Right? And so we go to the very being of God here to establish the teaching, the doctrine, the reality of the resurrection. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. You see, beloved, those are just, those are mere words of antiquity. They're just archaic words in a, in a, among an archaic people who worshiped a, an archaic God. Unless there is a resurrection of the dead. You see, so what if God is the God of Abraham? So what if God is your God? The Sadducees believed that God was their God. But they didn't believe in the living God. So what if God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or your God, or my God, if death conquered them and death conquers you? And so Jesus makes the resurrection an issue of divine proportion. In other words, God's glory is connected to it. This is one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul writes what he writes in Romans chapter 6 when he says, raised again by the glory of the Father. And so if you believe in the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and if you believe in Jesus Christ, you do believe in the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 4, he says, you, you, you have the faith of Abraham. He believed in God who raised him from the dead. That's the same God you believe in. And so if you believe in the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then you must believe in the resurrection of the dead because he is not the God of the dead. Death cannot be the ultimate conclusion for those who are God's. 
Now, what Jesus is saying here is still, for the most part, mere words. Anybody can say what he just said. Right? But what was going to happen in less than a week? In less than a week, what Jesus is saying here about God was going to be proven when God raised him from the dead to be the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And so by the power of his resurrection from the dead, he was declared to be the son of God, the living God. And so that everything that was said about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, there's a sense in which we could say came to full fruition in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 16 and 17. If the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You can believe whatever you want to believe. And it may, be a fa it may affect you in this lifetime. But when you're dead, you're dead. It's over. Or worse than that, it's not over. And you suffer the penalty of your sins, right? The judgment of your sins. But Christ is risen. You see, if Christ be not raised, Paul wrote, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. You see, the glory of God in the exaltation of his beloved son and the salvation glory of sinners is at stake. That is what's so significant about what Jesus is saying. He is not simply winning an argument with a group of religious leaders. He's not simply making the Sadducees look bad. He's not parading himself here as just the wise one who can conquer all arguments. He is leading us who would read this, the very record of God, to see indeed who he is. The life of God you see in your soul right now guarantees resurrection life. Listen. I know, well, maybe you aren't familiar with these verses. Sometimes I assume people are familiar with Scripture that you're not familiar with. Some of you aren't anyway. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. In you. Connect that with what you heard in the last hour. Christ and the Spirit. And the necessity of Christ and the Spirit and the Father. For your very resurrection. From the dead. Maybe I'll read. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Beginning in verse 4. For we who are in this tent. Groan. Being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, the living God, who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. There is a resurrection that every believer in Jesus Christ anticipates with joy. Our mortality will be swallowed up in the life of of God, enjoying fullness of life in relationship with one another. 
in full enjoyment of our God. Many sons in glory. So, whether we live or die, believer, we're the Lord's. Death does not separate us from our covenant relationship with the living God. It didn't with Abraham. It didn't with Isaac. It didn't with Jacob. And it won't with you. If you have the faith of Abraham, you are Christ's seed, aren't you? Abraham's seed. Alive in Christ. Notice as we close here, notice how personal Jesus is here. This is interesting. He says in verse 31, see, this isn't just abstract theology. He's not interested in just putting forth a doctrine. He says, concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you? Isn't that interesting? By God. Jesus is saying to these Sadducees, God is speaking to you through those ancient words written and they were reading them. God is speaking to you. Do you hear? Do you hear that today? God is speaking even today. Even right now, He is speaking to you through these words. Do you hear what God is saying? And how are you responding? You say, well, I, I don't need to respond and preach. I think you need to shut up now and just let, let you know, whatever happens, happens. No, well, why should I? Jesus didn't. Jesus was pressing them. And I would just suggest this to you. Don't be like the Sadducees whose lives were bound to this world. H how did the Sadducees respond? They were silenced. Verse 34. They, were si they didn't have any argument. They didn't have any comeback. They just went away. Silenced. At least there's no record of any of them believing. But by the way, we don't know that. If they didn't, if they continued in their unbelief, you know what would happen. They, they, would, they, will, they will face everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. And I'm saying that same thing is true for you and for me. But, but do you hear? There is a resurrection of the dead. Don't think and don't live like the Sadducees. Is the God of the living? Is He your God? Amen? Is He your God? If He's your God, you, you understand. You have life. Jesus, the great I am. He says in another place, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, He's going to live. He's going to live. The simple question is this. Do you believe him? Do you believe him? I trust you do. I trust you will. Respond. And brethren. May we be deeply affected. I want to close just by reading first John chapter three. Verse three verses familiar. But oh, may familiarity not breed. Uh, just an oversight of the depths of it. Because I want us to be deeply affected. I want to be deeply affected by our knowledge of the living God and the resurrection hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I know I'm going to say some of these things Tuesday, but, but you know, our brother is enjoying. I, I know it's not... Fully completed yet because the body's going to be resurrected. You understand that, but he is completely enjoying life right now with Jesus. First John three. He is waiting. And I'll mention this Tuesday, but 
there's a sense in which he's waiting with us. You remember what Hebrews says? I, I, uh, you know, we, we have not yet been perfected. We're, we're, we're with, you know, there, we're, we're sort of waiting to be perfected together, right? I mean, this is all gonna, there's a sense in which there is a, Second Corinthians 5, and I know I'm just rambling here, but, Second Corinthians 5, that there's something going on in this state right now where, where they are not disembodied. They're not disembodied. Second Corinthians 5. But there's, there's yet, there's yet a fullness of that, of that, uh, of the experience of the glory that is coming for all of us when our body and spirit will be united in a perfected way to live forever in a new heaven and a new earth, uh, to enjoy everything that God intends for us. But I digress there, coming back to 1 John 3. Behold what manner of love. The Son has toward us. Thank you. Sometimes I do that at the prison. I'll read a verse and they're all just staring at me, you know, and I'll say, is that what it says? And they'll say, yes, you know, and I'll say, no, it doesn't. It doesn't say that. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of of God. And you who are carrying an ESV or maybe another translation says, and so we are, I think is what they add. There's an addition there, which I'm not suggesting we add it, but that's true. That is true. We are right now. Therefore, the world doesn't know us. And we're going to be talking about some things among people who are of the world. They're not, they're not yet in Christ and, and they, they don't connect. They don't get it. What are you guys talking about? Just be patient with folks that are like that, okay? Love them. Love them. Care for them. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Oh, we shall be like him. We're in union with him now. We'll be experientially like him as much as, as much as a created one can be like the one who created us. As much as the divine nature can be our nature. For we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope, this is our hope. Everyone who has this hope in him. And that's what Jesus is driving at as he's speaking to the Sadducees. Oh, you Sadducees. Uh, there's a reason they're called sad, right? They're sad. There's no hope. There's no hope. Not for us. Everyone has this hope in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. Oh God, I pray.